Event Horizon, the novelization of the film by Stephen E. MacDonald. Chapter 16 Darkness rolled out, folded in upon itself. The safety line going through the core tightened, then rippled, as though refracted through water. Space contracted, expanded. Reality warped, a wave travelling silently out from the core. Light bent. The wave passed through the second containment walls as though they were air. Swept into the antechamber, pushing Krillin away and into the walls, the console. Debris erupted. Slammed into the walls, floor, ceiling, ricocheted away as the wave passed. Swept outward, down the main corridor. Windows vibrated as it passed. The safety line tightened again, sang, twanged, relaxed. Cooper shot down the corridor. The wave caught him in midair, spun him, sent him flat against the wall, swearing. The wind knocked out of him for a moment as he carooned away toward the opposite wall. He managed to roll before he hit, hitting the wall feet first, kicking off again. The wave ripped down the main corridor. Debris swirled before it. Flotsam that had been equipment or component parts of human beings. The event horizon was beginning to resonate now. The superstructure sounding with a deepening roar that suggested the ship was about to tear apart. The hatchway to the medical bay slammed open, the door buckling and a hinge tearing. A wave of medical debris swelled up before the wave. Miller grabbed the edge of the computer station he had been working on, ducking as debris pelted him. The wave pulled him up from the haven, wrenched him away from the console and slammed him into the bulkhead. Medical equipment peppered him, bounced from the wall, went spinning crazily away. His trajectory away from the wall took him back into the console, winding him, but giving him something to hold on to. The wave swept on into the bridge, shoving the dead man up against the bridge windows and causing Peters to bounce helplessly from the deck. She caught the back of one of the flight seats, holding on for dear life as momentum spun her around. The wave swept on outward. Stark, Smith and Weir were startled as Justin's point of view monitor tried to clear the for a moment. A vague image rolling amongst the static. Weir blinked, trying to clear his vision. He would have sworn that the image was of a man's face screaming. It couldn't have been, he told himself. Justin's wanted to clear the static again. Stark opened her mouth to say something. Miller's and Peter's monitors suddenly filled with static as well. The radio link hissed and went silent. What? Smith started to say. The Lewis and Clark began to rumble, a freight train sound that was incongruous out here in deep space. The ship began to shudder and rattle. To where it felt as though reality was trying to twist. The wave struck, ripping through the bridge. Metal was screaming somewhere in the ship, the superstructure stressing as the gravity wave passed through. Stark turned and ducked as the console flashed and sparked next to her. Behind Weir there was a loud bang as something shorted out, and he smelled ozone and burning insulation. The bridge lights flickered and dimmed. Deeper in the ship he could hear the sound of systems failing and metal tearing. Absurdly, he wondered if Peters' vid unit would be okay. It would t tear her up to lose the recording of her son. There was another sound too, shockingly familiar, because he had spent so much time unconsciously on alert for it. The sound of air escaping into vacuum. The fuck was that? Smith yelled. His question did not receive an answer. A klaxon was sounding now, emergency lights flashing. They were losing atmosphere. Stark had turned to her boards, getting answers from those that still worked. The bridge was filled with smoke that drifted lazily towards the hatch. We lost the starboard battle, Stark said. She looked up, her face holding an urgency that bordered on panic. The hole's been breached. The main pressure door to the bridge was closing, ready to seal them off. DJ would have to take his chances in the airlock bay, or wherever he was. With a low grinding sound, the pressure door stopped, half closed. Smoke drifted around it. Smith was frantically checking a console, trying to get the door moving again. After a few moments, he looked up, shaking his head. The safety circuits failed. Weir stared as the drifting smoke, the stuck door. We're losing atmosphere. There are pressure suits in the airlock, Stark snapped. Go! They sprinted for the hatchway. A smoke followed. A lazy snake. Chapter 17 
Dark, dark, deep in the dark. He was within, suspended. The dark passing through him, stripping him naked, peeling out the contents of his mind, pouring the pieces of his soul into a pool that floated in nothing. I touch all things. Who are you? I am. Another answer that made no sense. The darkness had no end. Innocence. The concept seemed almost a curse. What was wrong with purity? You know too well where the line is drawn. Points of light pierced the darkness. There was a sound of pain, of anguish. A circle of light, like fire breathed into the air. The darkness was not driven back. You are not the one I need. The points of light fell into the circle. What am I then? Dangerous. Lines of light fell from point to point. Because of this, yes, we cannot suffer the innocent to live. It profits us nothing. A five-pointed star within a circle. A shield. A hope. Without knowing how he did it, he brought it close, trying to reintegrate himself in the warm soul glow. Lady be with me. Blah. The darkness struck him. Crushing, overpowering, all that remained of his consciousness fell away from him. Silent and cold, Justin spun away through the darkness. Cooper shot through the opening into the first containment, slowing long enough to get his bearings as he approached the whirling tube. The sight sickened him, but did not slow him down. Oriented, he kicked off again, sailing through the microgravity like an underpowered version of Superman. One arm flung out ahead. He shot down the tube and into second containment, growling, Hold on, baby bear. Coolant was once again forming wandering globals. He splashed through several of them, splattering coolant left and right, making angry noises at the obstructions. Reaching out, he managed to kill his velocity by grabbing the main console, an effort that almost dislocated his shoulder. He caught sight of Justin's safety line, tore across the room, and made his way to it, following it down into the main area of containment. The line went all the way down to the core. It went into the core. Oh my god, Cooper whispered. The core was a pulsing black mass poised in the middle of the gloom. It seemed almost alive, angry. Justin had somehow fallen into it, or he'd been pulled in. The safety line had not slackened, which meant that it was still likely to be attached to him. Cooper put his hand on the line. It went slack. Cooper's heart skipped a beat and his skin felt so cold suddenly that he could have sworn his suit heater had quit. The cord rippled and pulsed outwards, a cold black explosion. Cooper started to back off, his heart racing. There was another pulse, bigger this time. Something light hurtled from the depths of the darkness, a human figure, Justin. Cooper kicked off, hurtling upward, his arms wide. Justin, limp as a dish rag, slammed into him, sending them both off on the new vector. The pulse from the core providing additional impetus. Cooper turned his head frantically, tumbling them slightly. They were heading straight for one of the long control rods that lined the containment chamber, a fatal encounter if they struck head on. Cooper twisted, kicking out, trying to change their position. He finally managed to put them both into a slow backwards tumble, praying that it would be enough. He clutched Justin tightly, closed his eyes and begged the gods for mercy. He felt the control rod slide by beneath his backside, slick and cold. He almost cried with relief. They slammed into the wall, rebounded, came up against the side of another control rod. Cooper was ready by then, holding onto Justin with one arm and gripping a long zero-G screwdriver in the other. He drove the business end of the screwdriver into the side of the control rod and hung on for dear life. It was a hell of a way to stop, between hitting the wall and this ad hoc breaking manoeuvre. Cooper figured he was going to be aching for the next two years. Cooper extracted the screwdriver bit and put the tool away on his belt, turning his attention to Justin. He pulled the younger man close, looked him over. Justin, you talk to me. Give me something here, Cooper said. Justin's head lolled to one side. The engineer was still breathing. There was no way to tell for sure until Justin's suit came off. But there were no overt signs of physical injury. No apparent bleeding. The suit was still secure. No visible holes or signs of air loss. Cooper closed his eyes tightly, wondering if he could pray enough to bring them both out of this mess in one piece. Baby bear, he said softly. Don't do this. Don't do this. Clutching Justin to him, 
He kicked off again, aiming for the exit. Behind him, the core pulsed with dark malevolence. Chapter 18 Medical instruments and debris whirled lazily in the air, some bouncing gently from the walls, ceiling, deck. The last vibrations had subsided now. Whatever had struck the event horizon had moved on, Miller realised. It did not seem likely to repeat itself any time soon. Cautiously, he rose out of his protective crouch, giving his suit a visual check as best he could. He turned around, surveying the damage. The hatch was buckled and torn, the door hanging by one bent hinge. Some medical instruments had been buried in the walls, ceiling, the floor. Cabinets and lockers had been blown open, contents spilling out to add to the general airborne chaos. No indication of air leaks. Small mercies, he thought. Auto keying his radio, he said. Can anyone hear me? There was an almost immediate response from Smith. Captain Miller! Miller sighed and frowned, but it was more with relief than annoyance. Smith, where the hell have you been? We have a situation here, Smith said. Miller suddenly felt ice cold. As far as Weir was concerned at the moment, the best way to make a man feel clumsy and incompetent was to make him get into an EVA suit in a hurry. DJ was patiently helping him with the details, which meant that DJ was taking a terrible risk himself. Stark was just completing her suit up, getting her helmet in place and locked down. Smith had managed to be in his suit faster than Weir had ever imagined it could be done. His helmet was already on, and he was holding a conversation with Miller. DJ slapped Weir's helmet into his suit. Weir reached up to seal it, hearing the hiss. The radio was already active. Smith was saying, We lost the starboard baffle and the hull cracked. Our safety seals didn't close. The circuit's fried. Do we have time for a world? Miller asked. To Weir, the captain sounded steady as a rock. He envied Miller, that cool detachment. DJ was suiting up quickly now. Stark came over to Weir, checking his suit, making sure his helmet was properly sealed. We're losing pressure at 280 litres a second, Smith said, and our oxygen tanks ruptured. In three minutes, our atmosphere will be gone. We are fucking dead. No one's dying on my watch, Smith, Miller barked. His was a voice you would choose not to argue with. What about the reserve tanks? They're gone, Smith said. There was a long silence. Weir pictured Miller racking his brain for a solution to the dilemma and failing to come up with anything acceptable. As far as Weir could tell, listening to the damage reports and Smith's pessimistic liturgy, there was only one option left to them. The event horizon, Weir said. Stark, Smith and DJ turned to stare at him. What? Smith said. Weir stepped towards Smith. Still has air and reserve power. We can activate gravity and life support. No one's breathed that air in seven years, DJ said. Could be contaminated. We can't stay in these suits, Stark said. The air won't last. I'm not getting on that bastard, Smith said, sounding angrier and angrier. We don't even know what happened on that ship. We turned to the pilot, his face set. It beats dying, Mr. Smith. Miller closed his eyes again. Tried not to sigh, opened his eyes. Weir's right. Get on board the event horizon. I'll meet you at the airlock. He started towards the ruined hatch, as Smith said. But you heard me, Smith. He stopped in the corridor, got his back up against the wall. Peters, are you with me? I'm ahead of you, Peters said. She moved across the main consoles, throwing switches, reading readouts. For all the design work thrown into the event horizon, the ship had some very standardised instrumentation. She had the boards figured out and operating. Bring in the thermal units online, she announced, pressing a keypad. She turned to another part of the console, making sure she had her feet planted firmly on the deck. Hold tight and prep for G's, she said, then counted the ten under her breath. She pressed another keypad. Beneath the decks, artificial gravity units ramped up, humming. Peters felt the rising fields as a pulsing, tingling sensation through her body. Suddenly she had weight again, not just mass. The frozen corpse, aloft once again, arced down to the deck. Peters jumped back as it shattered on impact, scattering frozen flesh and blood across the deck. In the second containment, Cooper heard the warning and aimed for the deck. Coolant or no coolant. An effort to make certain Justin was safe. He almost made it all the way before the artificial gravity pulled the two of them down. They hit the deck in a rain of coolant. Cooper held Justin close, trying to shield his faceplate with an arm. The grey downpour ended abruptly, 
leaving them lying in a slick grey pool. Cooper propped Justin up, making sure he was still breathing, then scrabbled his way upright, using the console for leverage. He looked down into the second containment, seeking the source of Justin's condition. The coil rippled with blackness, and seemed to turn in on itself, taking on a new solidity. Rings appeared around the main casing, spinning slowly. The dark energy seemed to bleed away to nowhere. Cooper shook his head. None of this made any sense. None of it. Something else caught his attention. Sections of Justin's safety line across the second containment. They had spread a considerable length of rope around the place after Justin had emerged from the core. But not all of it had come out. He tracked the sections. Both ended at the core. Both were lying on the gantry. Sheared through. There should have been a couple hundred metres more of the line. Cooper figured between those shear points. There was nowhere to be seen, but he knew exactly where it was and the thought of what might have happened froze him. Leeching his strength, he turned his back against the console and slid down until he was sitting in the coolant again. Oh baby bear, he thought, where did you go? Chapter 19 Miller raced through the event horizon, his feet pounding against the deck. Time was a critical factor now, and he had no time to waste in strolling down to the airlocks. This mission had gone to hell in a handbasket, and it was going to take a miracle to pull him back from the edge. He reached the airlocks just as Weir arrived, the rest of Lewis and Clark's crew coming behind him. Miller was mildly surprised. Weir's body language displayed an almost inhuman eagerness. Stark followed Weir into the ship, DJ arriving right behind her. Smith trailed in reluctantly, hanging back as much as he could. Miller glared at his pilot, but he no longer had any time to waste in cajoling the man along. Everybody okay? Miller said, looking them over. We're all here, Stark said. Okay. Miller took a deep breath, knowing full well that none of his crew would like his next selected move. Let's find out how much time we just bought. I still have to test the air, DJ said hurriedly. Miller shook his head. No time. This is the only oxygen we've got for three billion clicks. DJ stepped forward, lifting a hand. Miller did not expect the move to go much further than that. And if it's contaminated? I'll let you know, Miller said. He undogged his helmet catches and heard the hiss of the seal opening. He exhaled slowly and then lifted the helmet off, taking a deep breath. DJ was watching his face, unblinking. Miller breathed out. He smiled. Chapter 20 The event horizon rippled with light and power, coming alive. On the bridge, Weir moved easily between the different bridge stations, restoring power, bringing things back to life. Watching him, Miller found it hard to accept that the scientist had spent seven years away from his pet project, even harder to accept that Weir had spent relatively little time aboard the vessel before its ill-fated maiden voyage. He seemed completely comfortable aboard the ship, oblivious to the signs of carnage around him. Miller turned back to Stark, who had taken up residence at the communications workstation. She had spent the past ten minutes running one diagnostic routine after another, trying to ascertain the state of the communications equipment. She looked up now. The antenna array is completely fried. We've got no radio, no laser, no high gain. She looked directly into his eyes playing the brave soldier to the hilt. No one's coming to help us. She coughed suddenly, covering her mouth. This air tastes bad. Miller had to agree with her on that score. But you can breathe it. Not for long, she said. Not enough oxygen? Oxygen is not the problem, Stark said. Carbon dioxide. Miller's voice was flat. Stark nodded. It's building up with every breath we take. She sat back, rubbing her face. The CO2 filters on the event horizon are shot. Miller considered a couple of possibilities, then said, We can take the filters from the clock. Stark nodded again. I thought of that, she said, tapping her fingers on the communication station. With the filters from the clock, we've got enough breathable air for 20 hours. After that, we'd better be on our way home. Miller nodded, accepting that judgment. What about the life readings you picked up? Stark grimaced, then shrugged. The event horizon sensors show the same thing. Bio readings of indeterminate origin. Right before the clock got hit, there was some kind of surge. Right off the scale. 
and now it's back to its previous levels. Miller knew he was trying to get blood from a stone with this line of questioning, but he had to find answers. If he was going to keep everyone alive, he needed all the information that could be gathered. He had not had all the information when the Goliath went out from under him, and it had cost lives. What's causing the rootings? Stark looked back at the silent comms board, frowning. Whatever it is, it's not the crew. So where are they? He looked around, frustrated, feeling helpless. We've been over every inch of this ship, and all we've found is blood. We had paused in his peregrinations around the bridge. At the moment, he was standing silently, looking at a bloody smear high up on one bulkhead. Miller looked up at it too. There were many more around the ship. The only complete corpse they had discovered so far was now packed piecemeal into a cryogenic unit in the hope that they could get it back for analysis and disposal. DJ had barely complained about cleaning up the mess. Weir looked down from the bloody wall, then turned his head to look at Miller. There was something strange in Weir's eyes, but Miller pushed the thought aside. Right now, everyone was a little weird, some worse than others. What happened here? Miller asked. Weir remained silent. Chapter 21 Even with lights cutting into the darkness of it, the event horizon was a frightening beast of a ship, a huge construction that was difficult to comprehend. Against it, the Lewis and Clark was a speck, a pilot fish accompanying a whale. Feeling like a brother to dust, Smith clung to the hull of the Lewis and Clark, bulky in full EVA gear and cautious as he moved forward, one magnetic boot at a time. This was a hell of a way to earn a pension, but at least it got him off the event horizon. There was something sick and unholy about that ship. He had been certain of that since Weir had just started to explain what all this was about. Just ahead of him, there was a long rip in the hull plating. The metal had buckled together, tearing like aluminum foil under the pressure of the way that had struck the two ships. Vapor was still leaking slowly into space. He knelt down carefully, taking a closer look, then keyed his suit radio. Captain Miller, you copy? I'm here, Smith, Miller said. Jesus, Smith thought. Am I sounding insecure or something? Miller's tone was almost condescending. How's the clock? I'm fine, sir, doing okay out here, he bit his tongue. Miller was doing all he could. I found a two metre fracture in the outer hull. Should be able to repair it and repressurize. He paused for a moment. It's going to take some time. We don't have time, Smith. In 20 hours, we run out of air. That certainly put things into perspective. Understood, he said. Out here all alone then, which was fine, because he would rather be here than aboard that monstrosity of a spaceship. Neptune passed below him. A dizzying experience if he wanted to look in that direction. He kept his attention entirely on the Lewis and Clark. He reached to his utility belt, extracting the basic patch applicator, emptying it into the tear. The compound went in almost as a gel, but quickly foamed and spread. Within moments it had hardened. The patch would be durable, though not pretty, and secure once it was riveted into place. He tossed the empty applicator away, not watching to see it begin to fall in decaying orbit towards Neptune. He reached down to the utility belt again, pulling out a zero-gravity nail gun. He began riveting the edges of the patch into place, all tied to each other in one way or another. Planet, man, and ships hurtled on through the darkness. Chapter 22 Justin had retreated somewhere deep inside himself, Peter's thought. He had seen something, heard something, been somewhere that his conscious mind could not accept. And this condition was his best defence. Cooper had not been able to fill in many of the details, but he had been in a mild state of shock himself. She looked down at Justin, and her heart ached for him. He was too young, too kind, for this to have happened to him. Perhaps he should never have been assigned to this particular vessel in the first place. At this age, people ought to be confined to milk runs, let the grizzled old combat veterans fly in the desperate missions. Justin was stretched out on the diagnostic table, covered with a thermal blanket. Looking at him, it was hard to believe that there was anything seriously wrong. She looked up from Justin, 
DJ had stood on the other side of the bed watching her. She found his studious, neutral expression to be irritating. How is he? She said, trying to push her mind away from the annoyance. DJ was doing everything he could. The mask he wore was nothing more than his way of coping with the situation. His vitals are stable, DJ said slowly, but he's unresponsive to stimuli. He might wake up in 15 minutes, he might not wake up at all. Peters looked down at Justin again. He seemed to be sleeping. She turned away abruptly, squeezing her eyes shut, willing the pain back. There were things to be done. She headed for the bridge. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been chapters 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22 of Event Horizon by Stephen E. MacDonald, narrated by a patron of the channel and subscriber of the channel, Liam Anderson. I'm really enjoying this novelization, and I hope you are too. Be sure to thank Liam for narrating this for us, and if you're a patron and you would like to guest narrate a book in the future, let me know, and we'll set it up. Until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.